How are you guys? Sultan. Can you hear me? How are you, my yes. friend? Good, good. Are you Muslim, alhamdulillah, Jesus? No, not anymore, man. Uh, it's been about four months or five months since... Um... So, I'll just give you a bit of an update. I was born in Afghanistan. I came to Australia when I was four years old with my family. Obviously, you probably know what's going on in Afghanistan right now. My family yes. escaped the Taliban uh, because my father's family was in the military previously. Uh, they were educated and um, anybody that's educated and has a background in military, uh, the Taliban would have a list and they'd go after them, find them and kill them. So <clears throat> my family escaped so my brothers and I can have a better future and we ended up oh. in Australia. Uh, so, thank you, my friend. So throughout my life, obviously, I've been Muslim because I was born in a family that was Muslim. My father still prays five times a day. And um, I obviously, growing up in Australia, had lost kind of being in touch. Not lost my way of being a Muslim, but I'd forgotten how to pray and stuff. Uh, so I taught myself around four years ago. I was in university and um, I learned through YouTube videos with an English translation and then it was during Ramadan at the time and uh, I was fasting and praying five times a day uh, using the university prayer rooms and I wouldn't miss my prayers like I was that dedicated um, on the way to university I'd, on the way to the train station um, I live in Melbourne in Australia so I would drive from my house to the train station and then catch a train into the city uh, on the way to the train station and on the way back home I'd listen to the Quran with an English translation uh, in the car. <clears throat> and uh, the first four or five chapters that I learned, um, I thought to myself, wow, uh, this is so peaceful, you know. It's teaching me how to be a good human being, not judging others, helping those that are in need, etc., etc. And um, as I said, I wouldn't miss my prayers, but one of the first bad experiences I had was on the way back home. Uh, there was a bit of traffic and I was going to miss my afternoon prayers. So I pulled over. There was a mosque nearby, an Albanian mosque. I pulled over. I was running a bit late. So I did my wudu and everything. Walked in and uh, the prayers had already started. The group was all the way up the front. So like I said, when I was teaching myself, I wasn't really familiar with the with the rules and stuff that much. So I went in the corner and I prayed by myself because I thought, hey, I've already missed out. So I might as well not you know, go into the group. When the prayers finished, I went into the room where the shoes were kept and the sheikh in the mosque, he was a Somalian guy. Um, he came up to me and the way he spoke to me, um, it embarrassed me so much. Like he pretty much like almost shouted at me. He was like, how do you, why did you go and pray by yourself? Why didn't you join the group? I said, brother, like I'm just teaching myself, you know what I mean? Like. Why are you getting so angry? And that one of the Albanian guys, he came up and he actually defended me. He said, you know, the young brother's trying to learn. Instead of being so harsh with him, why don't you act nicely? So anyway, that finished. And then my experience throughout Ramadan was whenever we'd, we're about to break fast, I'd go to pray upstairs. And by the time I'm finished praying, I'd look around and there's no one there. Like my brothers, my dad, everybody would already be gone. I'd come downstairs and they're already almost finished eating. Same experience I had with uh, many of the other families that I went to uh, when we went to break fast at their house and my family friends and stuff. And I'd always question it, you know, like sometimes they'd make fun of me. They're like, oh, why do you take so long to pray and stuff? And I used to ask myself, like, am I doing something wrong? Because when I pray, I know exactly what I'm saying every time I bow down, every time I go into Ruku and into the Sajda. But uh, these guys are praying so quick. What's the deal? So anyway, long story short, um, I lost touch again with prayers and stuff. You know, I got busy with life. I started going out, went overseas and stuff, etc., etc. But in the last couple of months, uh, in the last year pretty much, uh, a couple of the Afghanistani people, they've got YouTube channels. Uh, one of the guys is very famous in my community. He used to talk about politics and he used to show how, like what the solution to saving Afghanistan would be. And yes. it was very different to what most people, because in Afghanistan, there's many different ethnicities and they're extremely, I don't know if I can say racist, but if you're a Persian speaker like me, uh, they kind of judge you and they call you judgmental. immigrants. They're very judgmental. Yes. They yes. call you yes. immigrants. 
and then there's uh, there's Shia Muslims uh, who are like a minority there. Uh, they're the Hazaras. Um, so throughout Ramadans and stuff, every year pretty much, they'd go and blow up Shia mosques. They'd go and blow up schools with children in it. They'd go and blow up universities and kill all the students that are trying to learn uh, because they're against people progressing in life. They're against education and especially against Shias, uh, the Shia minority who are very hardworking, mind you. Uh, even in Australia, they've come here and they've built all the businesses, all the Afghan businesses in Dandenong. They're all pretty much Hazaras. Um, anyway, long story short, um, I started hearing all these things about, you know, the prophet marrying a six-year-old when he's, when he's 50 and, you know, he's a warlord and he'd go and, like, attack others to take their wives and take their, take their land and their goods and stuff. And I always used to question it. I was like, you know, why are these people constantly trying to give the religion a bad name? Because, as I said, I was so into religion at the time and even after it, because, as I said, my family is Muslim, that I would think, why is it always them trying to put a bad name on Islam? And then it was one yeah. person, then two people, then three people. And then it started becoming not just non-Muslims, but people from my own culture and my own country. So then it kind of clicked on me and I thought, you know what? My dad was always telling me, you know, you need to get back into religion. You stop praying. I don't like it, whatever, whatever. It's better for you and the afterlife and all of that. <clears throat> so I started trying to teach myself again because honestly, I'd forgotten like the basics of, you know, what, what you say when you bow down and all of that. Um, then something in me was like, I don't know if it was a gut feeling. I started telling myself, maybe I should study the, the hadiths because at one stage I told myself, not to believe in hadiths because you know there were stories made up after the prophet etc etc then when i spoke to a few other guys uh, they said if you don't believe in the hadiths you're technically you're not muslim because that's the teachings of the prophet and the way yeah. he lived his life exactly so I was like, all right let me just look up into it you know what i mean let me see what these allegations that people throw in are they are they for real or not so the more I started studying, the more I kind of, at the start, honestly, I was kind of doubting myself and I felt like um, I was being, uh, how do you say it? I felt guilty because every time something would come true, an allegation would come true, I used to feel guilty and I used to tell myself, no, oh, this is just the devil whispering bad things in you because from an early age, that's the excuse that we get taught. It's always the devil whispering bad thoughts in your mind. That's why you do bad things. But yeah. now that I think of it, that's just an excuse for people's bad behavior. You know what I mean? And a lot of that goes on, especially in my country, which is a Muslim country where I was born. They pray five times a day, understand. but they pray five times a day, but there's no humility. There's no humanity. You know what I mean? There's no, um, there's no way of being a human. They tell themselves that we are Muslim first, then everything comes second. Um, so when I started studying, as I said, Firstly, the Prophet's marriage to Aisha, that became true. She was six years old, he was 51. And then when I brought this up in front of Muslims, they'd always be like, oh, but he didn't bed her until she was nine. So technically, you know, he waited. And I was like, man, three years, that's still a child. Then I read other hadiths yep. where yep. You know, she says herself, the Prophet married me when I was six. He moved me into his house, into another city or suburb when I was nine. And I took my dolls with And she me. used to play in toys yes. on the this swing. Is, this, is, this is where I'm coming. This is where I'm getting at. Yeah. I took my dolls with me. Even though playing with dolls and pictures were haram, the Prophet allowed me to do it. Okay? So she got a little hall pass. Then the part where the Prophet would get my friends to come into my house and play with me. And then whenever he'd step foot in the house, they'd all go and hide because, you know, they were... What's the call? They were being shy. Now that I think of it, I don't think they were being shy. I think they were scared that sh he might like one of them and marry them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then there was uh, the parts where I started hearing about the paradise and wives that, you know, people that are promised uh, that get into heaven, that pass this test supposedly that God has created on this earth for us, they get 72 wives. And then you get unlimited. More than uh, brother, in Dir al Mansur, fi tafsir al Masur, from Imam al Sayyuti, 12,000. 
Yeah, no, it's eighty-two thousand apparently. I've got, I've got the, I've got the surah here, uh, the hadith here. I'm not, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm talking. I'm not talking about the slave. The right hand possess only uh, the the woman's twelve thousand and hundred boy, Kulam. Yes. Um, so <laughs> where I read, it said eighty thousand servants plus seventy-two wives. That's Jami at Termidi twenty-five sixty-two. That's one of the hadiths. There's many more. Then I started thinking about it. I was like, what kind of God makes this life a test only for us to go into the other life into a, I'm sorry to use this word, but pretty much a brothel. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a nightclub where you get in, yes. you get 72 wives. There's unlimited drinking. You've got little, uh, little boys that don't have beards. So technically, if you're into boys, which a lot of people in my country are into, unfortunately, um, you know, you can enjoy them and they're at your service. There's birds that you look at and then automatically they fry up and you eat them and you never need to go to the toilet. And uh, the, the prophet also told his soldiers that because oh, one of them apparently asked him, they go, oh, prophet, if we die in battle, like you say, as soon as one blood is dropped in the name of Allah, we are promised you know, a, a, a palace in the afterlife that's made of gold and jewels and da-da-da-da-da-da. 72 <laughs> wives. I can't even sleep with one woman here. How can I service 72 wives nonstop? He exactly. said, no, over there you have the strength of 100 men. So you're, you're wow. constantly Superman and you're constantly boom, 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 one after another. You know what I mean? Um, yes. when, I, when I read all of that, I was like, what, like, what kind of God makes this life a test and then tells people that, you know, in the name of God, if you, if you want to convert someone and they don't accept, you can take their life, steal their land, take their possessions and take their wives. And that's okay, even without marriage. And in the afterlife, when you do die, there's all these promises of things that are very, very haram in this life. And that started making me question everything. I started thinking, why is this happening? So then I was like, okay, whatever. That's that. Okay, no worries. It kind of makes sense, even though the inner human in me does not accept it because it's just not right. Then I heard another thing. Uh, someone said that the prophet had a, um, a slave boy who he had rescued um, and he had converted into Islam, which technically became his adopted son. His name was Zaid. And uh, he had a wife. Her name was uh, Zainab, Zainab, and she was also a uh, slave girl who had converted into Islam. And Zaid and Zainab had been married. So the story goes, and this is in uh, Surah Al-Azab 37-38. So I've got references. I'm not talking out of my ass like some people are saying in the comments. Oh, Chapter 33, is... verse 37-38. Yes. Uh, 37-38, yes. So the story goes... Um, Muhammad walks into Zaid's house one day. He's not at home. His wife is by herself. She's wearing some sort of clothing that kind of outlines her figure. And then I'm not sure, I've, I haven't uh, read it in a while, but from memory, either he says it out loud or he thinks something along the lines of, wow, look at God's creation. So beautiful, you know, so curvaceous, so beautiful, so sexy, if you want to use the street words. And then, so he has these thoughts, and just after he has these thoughts about her, either the next day or not long after, her, uh, his uh, adopted son, Zaid, comes up to the prophet and says, Oh, prophet, I'm kind of sick of my wife. Why don't you marry her? And then he says something along the lines of, No, no, every man should keep his own woman, da-da-da-da-da-da. And then just magically, out of nowhere, not short, not long after that, Gabriel visits him. And brings this new message from God. And God says, Oh prophet, don't push away the women that I have gifted you. Why don't you marry your son's uh, adopted son's ex-wife so that there can be an example for the people after you that marrying your, your adopted son's ex-wife is not wrong. Exactly. And I sat there and I'm like, all right, the dude is not dead. If, if the adopted son died in battle and then the woman was there and no one could take care of her, you know, like the excuse that they use for his other wives, the, the widowed ones or the older ones. I sat there and I was like, if he was dead, I'd be like, okay, 
she's by herself. You know, it's Mecca back then in the desert and women don't have the rights to go work, whatever, whatever. So she needs someone to support her. And he married her. I would be like, okay. But the dude is alive. You know, Zaid's walking around perfectly fine. And uh, suddenly, like I said, the surah comes in and makes it okay for him. And I started thinking, I was like, could it be that this person who is acting like the prophet of God, you know, the last messenger after 124,000 messengers came in, God still didn't have the power to bring people, you know, onto the right path. So he sent this final one. And now all of a sudden he's demanding all these things and just magically happens that whenever he likes a girl, even if she's six years old or it's his adopted son's wife, then suddenly God sends a message and says, hey, this is okay. You have to do this because I have given you this gift of a wife or a woman or a child. And I started thinking, I was like, this sounds like someone that wants to make these things up for his own benefit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the people back then, obviously, they were in the desert. Half the time, they didn't even have a sip of water to drink. You know what I mean? They didn't have food. So he promised them all the things that weren't in the desert. You know, he said there's going to be flowing rivers in heaven. There's going to be palm trees where you can sit under the shade. And I started thinking, I'm like, okay, we're in heaven. Is there going to be sun and moon? Why do we need shade? Is there going to be rain? You know what I mean? And yeah. why does one need 72 wives? Why does one want wine constantly? Why? What happens to the women? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because a lot of the times when you bring up the women issue, a lot of Muslims, we call, I call Muslims, my family even, my, my mom and dad call a lot of Muslims in Afghanistan, story Muslims. In Farsi or in Persian, we say Qasab Musliman, which means story Muslims. So they've just been brought up and I can almost vouch and guarantee that at least 90% of Muslims in Afghanistan, because Arabic is not our language, they don't know the meaning of what they're reading and what they've been told. The mullahs exactly. or the priests and the sheikhs that are in these mosques, half of them are child molesters. They literally molest kids that come into the mosque in the excuse of teaching them the Quran. They end up getting yep. molested, unfortunately. You know what I mean? And this yes. leads to a vicious cycle and it continues on. They'll become... Um, half is of the Quran and then they'll go into mosques because there isn't really any other industry for them to work. They're freeloaders. The, 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 the sheikhs and the mullahs in Afghanistan are freeloaders. They wait for someone's death. They wait for kids to, you know, become of age, seven, six, eight years old so people can come pay them to learn um, um, uh, the Quran and then they get taken advantage of. So long story short, what I'm getting at is, like I said, a lot of times when you bring up the women issue uh, with Muslims or with these story Muslims, uh, they'll tell you, oh, what are you talking about? Islam is the first religion that brought women's rights. In the Quran, it says that uh, heaven is at the feet of your mother. So then now, because I know, I have studied, I know the truth, I say, that okay. Is a, that is a, a fake uh, hadith. Is right, a lie. There is no hadith, the heaven under the feet of mother. There is no hadith like that. Yes. The no, new no. writing down is not, uh, not from Muhammad. One. <clears throat> brother, even yes. if Continue, there is, brother. even if there is, there's so many contradictions. You know what I mean? This is why when I sit down and I say, when someone tells me, literally, oh, Quran literally calls a woman animal. That's what I'm getting at. On one end, mm-hmm. you're saying that the, the heaven lies under the feet of your mother. Then at the same time, your prophet is saying women are nakis rakal, which means they're half the intelligence. So therefore, their witness statement is half of that of a man's. Their death is half of that of a man's. Their prayers is half of that of a man's because when they go through their menstrual cycles each month, they can't pray, they can't fast. Therefore, whatever deeds they do is pretty much half. Even she can't touch the Quran. <laughs> yes and then i sit there and i'm like what kind of women's rights is this you know what i mean like it doesn't make sense there's so many contradictions there's literally so many contradictions there's many other things that i've got in my notes here uh so there's Me that, too. There's I, was, that. I was just reading the when god the mighty and majestic decrees his creation he laid down <laughs> he I laid put one down. foot on the other <laughs> yeah, Brother Sultan, uh, yes. if you don't mind, maybe I invite you to tell 
to brother and sister your testimony on my YouTube channel? What do you think? Um, yeah, I One can day. do that. When you have a time, when you are free, I will sure. give you my WhatsApp number in a private. Sure. And just tell me where you are free and we can do it on my YouTube channel for all brother and sister listening to your testimony. Sure. If you thing. have a time in the future. Of course, why not? Yeah, you. just uh, message me. But before I go, um, also another thing, there's a there's a video on my profile, on my um, on my TikTok profile. There's many others, but I've uploaded one. I always used to think that, you know, I used to see videos of Hajj and all of that. And it used to bring this like, you know, like I used to get goosebumps and like this feeling of like peace just by watching it. And then I used to hear stories of like people that I've been to university with who are still very committed Muslims. And this guy told me that um, when they went into Hajj, um, they went into these bookstores where they wanted to buy some book or his uncle or whoever wanted to buy this book, a history book. And he said, yes. I swear to God, he goes, when we asked for this book, it was on one of the top shelves and the bookseller didn't have a ladder or anything, but he stacked up a few Qurans, put it on the ground, stepped on it to try to get this book off the top shelf. And he goes, that just shocked me. You know what I mean? When I watched one mm -hmm. of the documentaries that came out, it was a while ago. It was on SBS on one of the local TV channels in Australia. They were talking yes. about all these journeys of different people from different countries going into Hajj. So there was a dude in Indonesia who was a uh, businessman, so he had a very easy... And there was one guy from Africa who was very poor, and he said he had saved for, I don't know, over 10 years, pennies he had saved to go to Hajj. And this poor guy had to catch a bus, had to go through all these, you know, hard journeys. It wasn't just a jump on a plane and get to Mecca. When he went into Hajj, this was all being documented on, on camera. I swear on nature which is what i swear on now because my belief in god is unfortunately gone for now but i swear on nature and everything i love they literally show this guy under those tents go to sit down to eat and one of the hajj police come up to him and tell him he can't sit with everybody else he has to go sit with the africans all right so they had a separate section for just the black people and he had to go sit there and i saw that i'm like what the heck is going on here then all these videos come up. Like I said, it's on my profile now. Go see it. There's guys literally pushing one another, screaming, Allahu Akbar, trying to get mm -hmm. to that black stone that's on the side of the Kaaba so they can stick their head in and give it a kiss. There's videos of women, literally, all you see is their heads moving around like old women, someone's mom, someone's grandma, someone's sister. All these men pushing around. There's no humanity. Everyone forgets about, oh, we're all brothers and sisters in the Ummah. You know what I mean? We need to look after each other yeah. because we're all servants of God. They forget about that. Everybody wants to Allah. do their own thing. Hundreds Allah. of people get trampled every year trying to throw stones at, at the shaitan, at a, at a wall or a pillar where they think it's shaitan. You know, it just doesn't make sense to me. All the people in the comments, please. Like, this is the problem, <laughs> unfortunately. A lot of Muslims have no general knowledge or no knowledge of their own religion. Please go and study. Exactly. Don't listen to don't listen to these cherry picking sheikhs that only show you the good stuff. Most Muslims literally cherry pick Islam. They pick the ones that are good, and they either don't know there's bad apples and bad cherries, or they completely ignore it. I yes, explained exactly. this to some of the other uh, Persian speakers or Afghanistanis. We've, there's a growing group now of people that are seeing the truth and they're trying to spread the truth so they can raise awareness about what's happening in Afghanistan, what's been happening in Afghanistan for the past 40 to 50 years under the name of God. All right, The country is literally ruined. It's, it's been an Islamic country. Everybody's been throwing jihad, but you see the kids on the streets begging. Kids that are five, six, seven, eight years old this is the most important part of their life, you know, the most important time. They need to study and become someone, learn something. But they're on the streets begging, selling plastic bags, you know, they're collecting rubbish, they're selling pens. They do that during the day, and you know what happens at night to most of them? The people that pray five times a day, they've got their foreheads are protruding because they've they've slammed their heads so many times on the ground praying to God. 
those same guys that pray five times a day end up molesting those poor kids on the streets. Yeah. And they yeah. sit there yeah. and they point the fingers at non-believers and infidels and they call everybody kafir. Most of these exactly. people that even migrate, all right, they migrate into these Western countries. And I see a lot of Afghanistanis do that right now. They go into Europe, they come into Australia, they go into America. They, what they do, their name hasn't even been written in pencil yet, as we say in Persian. All right, they, they haven't even become permanent resident yet. They go into their mosques, they form these groups, they, they, be, they meet their other brothers and sisters in Islam, and they end up talking crap about the same government that has given them all the freedoms of their own people, regardless of their religion. No one has said, oh, you're Muslim, you're not allowed to come here because this is a Christian country. Why, yeah. I ask those people all the time, why didn't you go and move to an Islamic country? Why didn't you go to the center of Islam in Saudi Arabia? I would like to see you guys go there and live there for one week. They will treat you like absolute dog shit. Excuse my French. Literally, if you're not a Saud, they will literally treat you like dog shit. And then you guys come here on to, into Western countries and you talk smack about them being yes. hellbound and them being kafirs and non-believers. You know what I mean? People losing their shit because some person uh, um, exercised their right of freedom in Denmark or Sweden by burning a Quran. That's their, that's their legal right. They're allowed to do it as their country. These guys come onto the streets screaming, Allahu Akbar, disturbing the peace. I ask you guys, brothers and sisters, wherever you guys are from, your, your Muslim people, why doesn't anybody get up and, and uh, protest when the Taliban and ISIS go and blow up Shia mosques where hundreds and thousands of uh, um, Qurans get burnt after they get blown up. Why, why, why doesn't one cleric stand up and protest that? But when somebody in a, in a non-Muslim country gets up and burns one Quran, everybody loses their shit. Everybody wants to burn down police cars and destroy uh, businesses and stuff. Is this right? You guys living in Western countries, enjoying the freedoms that they've given you, there's two possibilities of you living in a Western country. One, like most of the people that I know do, you take the government's money, you take welfare. Where does that welfare come from? Muslim brothers and sisters. Where does it come from? It gets us. collected from tax. Night from clubs. tax of Christian tax. Night yes, clubs. us working hard every day. Guys, including nightclubs and brothels. All right? They pay tax. They and get pagan. Halal. And the halal. Pe pork, pork. And the <laughs> exactly. pork also. Yep, exactly. Yep. And that money gets full <coughs> and they start giving out welfare. To all these Muslims, majority of them come here and they freeload. They don't want to study. They don't want to work. They just want to take free money and enjoy it. I know people right here in Australia, guys, all right? They're, they're married, married couples with kids. They will go and tell the government welfare agencies that his <coughs> wife and his uh, husband, that wife and husband are separated. The husband will give a friend's address or a family member's address, tell the government they've been separated, you know, just, just to say it so the wife and kids can get more benefits. You know, their, their paycheck increases. Then those same people that are on welfare, welfare as well, they'll go behind the government's back and work cash jobs, okay? So they don't have to pay tax and get the free money from welfare. <clears throat> Your second possibility for whoever's listening, living in, in uh, non-Muslim countries, is Muslim people that are living in non-Muslim countries. Your second uh, way of living in, in non-Muslim countries, you have to pay tax. When you work, you pay tax. What do you think happens with that tax money? If you lived in America, that tax money did what? There was a war in Muslim countries. That tax money went towards bullets and explosives that killed, so-called killed your brothers and sisters. If, it, if there's no war, where do you think your money goes? It goes to Saudi Arabia to buy oil. What do you think Saudi Arabia has been doing with that money in the last 10 to 15 years? They've been killing Yemenis. They've been making Yemeni kids homeless, all right? killing exactly. their fathers mothers you that's what your tax money is contributing so how can you sit there in a non-muslim country go to mosques and scream allah akbar in your rooms and then still act like you're you're a good muslim that's that's what i want to know but like i said when i bring this stuff up when i was muslim you know what they used to call me you're a liberal muslim i had never heard of this word before you're a liberal <laughs> you are whitewashed you're, you're they come a up with new genders sultan I, so, yeah. Sorry, what you all, say, I gotta, all I got to tell you, Sultan, is this. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. Oi, oi, oi. 
No, this is there what I'm go, saying, brother. brother. There you this go, is what brother. I'm saying. In, in Australia, we live in the best country in the world. Literally, we do, it, brother. And uh, uh, I can relate to your story quite uh, quite a little bit. Okay, I was in a communist country and we suffered as well. And uh, I came here and I love this country. I would do anything for this country. I adapted to this country's laws and everything it stands for. Yes, yes, hundred percent. This is what I'm, this is what hurts me, brother. All right, when I see people coming here and in other countries, Western countries, where they get given, like I said, every right, every human right, and more. In Australia, in America, immigrants. Yes, give, here in America, we treat them. We treat them good. We treat them good, and they always come, always come and do everything they want to do. After they, after they get up, you see them when they first come. They be right there on the. Even the moms, I, I feel sorry sometimes. I, I see the moms with little babies. They got like a like a string ring, where they bring a lot of women and they and they put them in New York and in each corner and they ask for money with their kids with a with a with a with a staple and then you see them picking them up in some nice cars picking the girls up after they make a good 300 or 400 dollars within three hours they pick them up boom take them and we, we be like wow you know it's this just is, crazy this, how they how they work it's just this crazy. is what i'm saying they they bring in the systems all right from they destroy countries. them they they, 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 they they bring in the systems from their countries like i said if if you move here and there's a lot of there's a lot of people from afghanistan that i know personally they've come here let me here. tell you a small story brother sultan yes go ahead so our our uh you know our brother and sister from our country in islamic country they're dreaming to be in christian country anyway in uh, sia walking anyway they're dreaming to be in a christian country when he be in a christian country next week he will start preaching quran asking sharia law man you're running away from sharia law you're running away from sharia law and you came to christian country to ask government for sharia law what are you talking about the Muslim running from Sharia law in Islamic country to be safe in a Christian country. When he be in a Christian country, save the government, give him medicine for free, doctors for free, uh, schools for free, everything free, and give it him a uh, welfare and other things that support him and he be a man, a human being. Next week, he will start Asking Sharia law, Allahu Akbar Sharia law. What? You're running away from Sharia law. Yeah. If now Sharia law controls this country you're living in, I will see you. You running? You were running to where? You will come back to your country? Absolutely not. You're running away from your country, and you're asking Sharia law control this country, and if. Sharia law control this country too. Let me see your face. You're running away to where? To where? There is no place to running away. You're running away from Sharia law. And you're coming to ask the government, the Sharia law control the, this country too? See? Contradiction in mind. Yeah. 100%. This is what I'm saying. Like I said, my parents moved here for us to have a better future. My father, although he prays five times a day still, he's old, you know. Like I said, like we we were born in a, in a Muslim country where from the minute we are born, it literally in our ears, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. That gets, that gets pushed into our ear. Then we yeah. go to school, same thing. Then we go to mosque or the mosque is constantly around us. That's that's our culture. That's our life. You know what I mean? And like I said, yes. it's all in Arabic. It's not our language. When I when I say this stuff, a lot of a lot of Muslims will jump on me, especially Afghans. They'll jump on. Yeah, exactly. It's not our language. It, the Quran is such complicated language that even Arabs who, who speak Arabic can't translate it. How can you come here with a few translations and tell me that this is this? You know, those are all wrong. And I sat there and I'm like, 
what kind of God creates a book that no one can understand, including the people whose language he brings it down on? You know what I mean? Well, how does that work? Because in the Quran, it says we have made this book in mm -hmm. the most simplest language so everybody can understand. So yeah, I right. sit there and I'm like, what you're saying and what the book is saying contradicts itself. As I said, like most other things in this book. And the fact that certain things have been said again and again, again and again. It's like, why does God, the most merciful, the most beneficent, have to constantly repeat the same thing again and again? And why do, do his words contradict each other? I don't get it. You know what I mean? It never made and sense. He, 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 this God, God he's been like God. a temp. He's a false this God. God. This God be like a temp. He offered the woman to the man for he following him. Here and in paradise. Look what kind of God that. According to Quran. Muhammad, according to Tafsir Quran, he said, Go fight with me and you will have it a blind woman and Roman woman. And one guy, his name, grandfather, a judge, he told him, Muhammad, ask me, but don't tempt me. Ask me, but don't tempt me, which means don't work, don't play on my desire, on my wishes. Don't play that game. For that, Allah, he downloaded verse in Quran. So, Muhammad, he made this religion according to private part of the males. Mm -hmm. Go with me, you have a woman. Go with me, you have a woman. If you die, no problem. I will guarantee for you women in a paradise. No problem. Because it's main religion. It's not for, yep. for, for females. Specifically for the men, this religion. You can see all the Quran offering stuff for the men, all the men. And even the man control the woman in Quran. The woman nothing, like furniture in home. The woman like furniture in home, nothing. For dinghy dinghy and for kitchen, that's it. That is woman in Quran, even in Hadith. Muhammad always, uh, just this point, guys, God bless you, just this point. Always, and when I speak with Arab speakers, tell me how Muhammad respects the woman. He will bring one verse in Arabic language. He said, Rufqan bil qawarir. Do you know what that means? Be careful about the battle, the battle of water. So the woman like a bottle of water in, in a hadith. Rufqan bil qawarir. Be careful about the bottle. Bottle of water. So the woman like a bottle of water. Take care of bottle of water. Wow. Go ahead, brother. Sorry, I cut you off. No, on. that's okay. Uh, I'll just raise a few other points. Sorry if I'm talking. Brother Sultan, so just yes. if I may imagine, imagine all the um, disgusting things that are going on in Islam here on earth. Now, do you think that they're going to go to paradise? And have sex with uh, with virgin and so on and so on in the front of holy of holy, they're gonna be doing even more disgusting things up there. Let's wow. be honest, brother. Let's this be is, honest, brother. We're talking about holy of holy here. This is the point that turned me. Okay, because as as the host said, what kind of God creates everyone? All right, then. After 124,000 messengers, he sends one final one who's supposed to be so complete, so, uh, as they say, um, a, an example of a good human being. Then this person becomes pretty much a warlord, spreads Islam through the sword, all right? Not by word, not by kindness, through the sword. Then, at the same time, he gets gifted all these women. Then, at the same time, it's not just the women that he marries, but... It gets said in the Quran that those who are married are haram for you, unless they're the married wives of the non-believers who you destroy in battle. Then you can take them, no worries, and you can enjoy them yourself or pass them along to your soldiers. Then in the afterlife, once you, like I said, shed a drop of blood, 
under the name of God and Muhammad's uh, war. You'll go over there, and then there's 72 wives for you sitting mm. there. And I, so and then, as you said, uh, yes. That should just make you think. Now, to give you uh, a really quick uh, example how how true and how beautiful our Bible is, I'm not sure if you know much about the Bible, but in our Bible, right, the truth is there everywhere. We were pre-warned about Islam. And what do I mean by that? In our Bible, it says, even if an angel came from the heaven to bring you another uh, another uh, scripture, should be cursed. Why? 620 years later, Sultan, this is exactly what happened to Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Another angel came and he brought another scripture. So we were pre-warned by our God that this would happen. Mm -hmm. This is how mm -hmm. true our Bible is, brother. They have no, not one brother miracle. Sultan. They have nothing. Yes. Yes, God yes. Bless you, brother Revolution. Brother Sultan, I yes. be like you. I supposed to be studying the Sharia when I was young. I'm from Syria, Aleppo, north of Syria. We called in our language Halab, Aleppo. I studied the religion. I used to be Sunni. I studied when I was young, young boy. So after I study Madhab is Sufi because our relative is Sufi in Halab. Yes. After a couple of years, I choose to be Salafi. I follow Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah and Al Albani and blah, 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 all those scholars. And I become, I read a lot of books. But same your situation. After that, I become atheist. And I read a lot of things about the revolution, Big Bang, blah, 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 everything. But that doesn't make sense for me when i read the bible i accept it logically you can see my testimony in my youtube channel brother but i i will invite you just read um, gospel matthew 5 6 7 you will see what jesus christ teach the believer to do let's see sister sophia yes Sister Sophia, are you there? Go ahead, sister, if you want to say something. Oh, okay, sorry. I'll, I'll okay, just, brother, uh, continue, Brother Sultan. Sorry, I'll just, I'll just keep it short and I'll finish off. Um, there's also a few things about uh, the life of Muhammad. Um, in Farsi, we call it uh, Sirat Muhammad which means pretty much the history of his life. Um, there was one of the battles that, a lot of battles are obviously mentioned, but one of the battles in particular, um, in most battles that are mentioned in there, this um, also another thing that didn't make sense to me. He's going into battle, his soldiers are leaving their wives and their kids in the promise that, you know, if they, if they die, there's going to be 72 women waiting for them in the afterlife. But, he takes his wife or wives with him to every battle. You know what I mean? Yes. The wife or yes. wives are in the tent with him. He's, He's choosing one himself. of them. He's choosing one, take it with yes. him. Yes. And while he's having intercourse and enjoying himself, these soldiers are out there dying and leaving their kids and wives. Then there was a story of how um, in one of the battles he... Uh, takes a kameez or kaniz, what we what we say in Farsi, is like a sex slave, pretty much. You know, after they win the battle from one of the non-believers' wives, and he literally just uh, pitches a tent or puts a cover, and he's having intercourse with her, while his companions are pretty much next door listening. Uh, now, I don't like reading comments usually when I'm on lives and stuff, but a few people keep saying, keep parroting the whole. If it's so bad, why is it the fastest growing religion in the world? Let me give you a little experience of what I have about converts from what I've seen so far, in the Western countries at least. Most of the guys that I know I've heard of that have uh, become Muslims are people that are in prison. Amen. Okay? They're in prison. Their lives are a wreck. They've got mental issues. They've got nothing else to do. And the most important factor, they get protection when they join Muslim groups in prison, okay? This happens in Australia, it happens a lot in America. Yes, in America too. Okay. Even yeah, in America, you can see only the criminal in a jail, they're accepting Islam. 
so fast. Yep. yep. Yes. And it's also people that have had some sort of trauma during childhood or if you see women that have been heartbroken, okay, and they've gone through some sort of traumatic experience either recently or throughout their lives. And then either they, they become friends with someone that's Muslim or they, they search something up and they're in search of something that makes them feel good. It's like, uh, picture this, you're in a long relationship with someone, you're in love, and then somehow it doesn't work out. They either cheat on you, they break up with you, and you're very hurt. What do you do? You try to seek something that gives you comfort. And usually that's a rebound relationship, Okay you get with someone that you're not really interested in, but they make you feel comfortable. They make you feel wanted and loved. And that's well, usually actually, called... Yes. Brother, actually, the guys that were in prison that came out, came out, met one of these girls. They, they didn't know nothing about Islam, but they were Christian, but fell in love with the guy. The guy involved her in the, in the, in the, in the style, in the friendship that the that the Muslims uh, uh, carry within within Muslims. And next thing you know, she fell into Muslim and, to, and, and took the shihada. Next thing you know, she's a Muslim without even knowing what she got into. This is the thing again. No, like, like I said, uh, I've, had, I've, I've had Afghanistani women. Uh, I've only been active on, on TikTok for probably about a month. Uh, you know what I mean? As I said, I only started seeing the truth of the religion that once I, I followed uh, only in the last three or four months. But in the last month, I've been on a few lives and uh, I only started joining lives probably about two weeks ago. And on one of the, one of the lives where this is called the free thinkers generation, where there's a bunch of uh, Afghanistanis, Iranians, you know, Farsi speakers or Persian speakers. Yeah. And we talk about our pain and how we've become immigrants and this and that. I raised up the, the problem that I had with, the prophet, the, the, the example of what a good human being should be, marrying a six-year-old, you know what I mean? Then bedding her at the age of nine. And mm -hmm. I, I kid you not, uh, some, one of the women came up, she sounded like she was in, well in her 40s and 50s, obviously lived in a non-Muslim country. And you know what her excuse was for this? She said, if Aisha was happy, what is your problem? She was with him for nine years. You know, he died when she was 18 or whatever mm -hmm. the mathematics ends up being. And throughout that whole time, up until the age of 72, 73, whatever it is, that she died, she never said one bad word about the prophet. And I sat there and I was like, are you serious? Like you're giving that as an excuse that a child at that time who had no knowledge of the outside world. All right. Picture this. You're a kid and there's a very famous celebrity in your town. Okay, and but you've she got poisoned no... him. She poisoned him. No, no, listen to this. It's called grooming. Okay, it's literally called child grooming. That's what this is. And the fact that there's women standing up and defending that, it, it literally made me feel sick. I sat there and I was like, do you know what your level is in your religion? You, you are literally a second class citizen. There's, there's literally hadiths and sheikhs yes. screaming off the top even of their Quran, lungs. Even in Quran. Even in Quran. There's, there's literally and, sheikhs right now. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, and a woman, you can uh, buy it from the, the family, father or mother. Of, if it doesn't have a father or mother, you can buy it from brother or uncle or auntie. It doesn't matter. The woman, you can buy it for marriage in Islam. If you have money, yes. you can buy a lot. You, you give them the mehr. And then Mahar, yeah. What does that mean, Mahar? Food. Yes, it's in our country. We said in our country in Syria, if someone he doesn't have a lot of money, he want to get married. He found a beautiful lady. They didn't ask about her mind, what she do. No, no, no. Just a face. Oh, wow, beautiful. She cooking. Wow, that is beautiful woman. And they will ask. They will go to the house. They see the, the man and the man, he will ask, okay, I will come, I'm coming to marriage your daughter. Give me time. They will ask about him. This is guy has some money, his work, what kind of work he do. And after that, they will let him come. They will come. Okay, so my daughter, one million, the first, 
one million the last and we needed a half a million gold and we need and we need and we need and the guy if it doesn't have money what he said oh man please the price is getting negligible can you fix the price for me please i don't have like that much which means buy and sell the woman's in islam buy and sell you you know that right i, I think you know that sultan of course, right of course uh what's happening right now in in afghanistan is um, this happened in the first round of the Taliban as well. One of the first lives I joined, there's a guy actually living in Melbourne in Australia, in my city. Young guy, very, very handsome man. He plays music sometimes on his lives, you know what I mean? He sings and stuff. And I joined his live because they were talking about Islam and everything. And then... 24 hours, Islam yeah. only. Because they claim, the brother and the humanity Muslim people, they claim that Islam is true religion. We always try to prove it. Yes, Islam is a true religion, man. Why didn't follow Islam? Come on, follow Islam. Follow Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, he is a young man. He is a handicap, according to Hadith and Quran. Let's see, uh, we have a brother here, PHL Truth. Sorry, Let's see Ahmed, if we catch you continue. Muslim. Sorry to cut you off, mate. Uh, I'm going to be in a bit of a hurry, so I'll need to leave soon. But if you don't mind, I'll just bring out a few, a few more points. Uh, that while you were go ahead, brother, take your time. Go ahead, you are very yeah. welcome. Uh, I just go ahead. I just wrote a few notes off the top of my mind that I forgot about before. There's a fair few, so please be patient with me. And if at any time you need to cut me off, just let me know. Um, one other issue that I've encountered in the last couple of months, at least in the last couple of weeks since I've been active on TikTok, is uh, the blatant insults and disrespect that Muslims get to when they are challenged on their points. Um, I was on a live, one of the first lives that I ever actually went on, just as a viewer. I didn't have many followers at the time to jump in the box, but it was a Nikabi Somali girl from Melbourne, from my city in Australia. And uh, she, they were talking about Islam, da 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 da. Then it got to a point where randomly she was looking for a topic to discuss because her viewers were dropping down. So I guess she needed some entertainment. So she ended up deciding to put uh, Jesus is not God. Um, and the the way that led up to her deciding that topic was a few other people joined in and they were they were literally looking for entertainment. Um, it's like as if like a bunch of school bullies want to look for weak students to pick on so they can have a laugh. Uh, so when the topic was decided, a few people from America joined in and one of the guys, I'm pretty sure he was uh, he was African-American. I could tell from his accent. Um, he brought up the whole nikas al uh Sorry, nikas al uh, You know, the Naqisat intelligence of the women. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, he brought that up and he even opened up the hadith. He put his camera on and he said, oh, what's this? You know, like you guys are, con uh, you guys are um, saying one thing on one end, like I, said, like I mentioned before, and you guys are saying something else. I swear on nature, okay? I swear on my dead brother's grave. Uh, one of the guys jumped in because she had nothing to say. She literally had nothing to say. She, she, the live topic was ask me anything about Islam. All right. And she literally had nothing to say. So in order to get help, she waited for a bit. She must have messaged someone. And one of these young guys from America came on, uh, guessing he was Arab. But, uh, his attitude honestly was one of the first things that kind of, even up to that point, I was still a bit 50, 50 on everything, but his attitude just turned me off like religion in general especially islam because he was literally i can hear him you know when when someone um is enjoying something when they rub their hands uh i could i could hear from his voice that that's what he was doing and he kept saying yes bring on christians tonight i'm gonna serve their head on a plate for them i i want to just you know like debate christians and this and that this and that and he just turned into someone that was just bullying he constantly would jump in, cut you off, uh, wouldn't let the other person speak. Uh, instead of answering the question that the guy asked about the Nikas Rakal, he kept bringing in, you know, but in your Bible it says this, in your Bible it says that. So I was like, okay, I was patient. But a week later, once I gained enough followers, um, I jumped on in the box. And first of all, when I started speaking, they started coming up with excuses. Uh, the guy was like, yes, Rabbi Chad is the one. Yes, that's the one, Rabbi Chad. 
Um, the person in the comment recognized the person. Um, first, they started questioning me. They're like, oh, how are you able to jump in the box? You don't even have a thousand followers, this and that, this and that. I was like, all right, whatever. Um, then I started mentioning the whole, you know, like be a bit respectful. I even mentioned a hadith from Muhammad where he says, if a person has even an atom's worth of weight in their heart of cockiness or pride, they will not, he or she will not enter heaven. Yeah. I mentioned that. And like I said, instead of understanding these people, this is where I got called a liberal Muslim. When, when I said, you know, you guys are all living in the West instead of appreciating it and accepting that you live in a non-Muslim country, be nice to people, be kind to people. Even in our own religion, it says we have to accept the books that are before us. You know, Abrahamic faiths are supposed to be our brothers and sisters. And God will judge each one according to their own books and according to their own deeds. But you guys are going against that. And that's why I said, like, they just jumped on me and there was a whole bandwagon. And then all this uh, personal insults started getting thrown at me. And then I got dropped off from the box they kicked me out and then in the comments and the people that were still on they were just like i said literally um just in just direct insults about me personally they were saying i was whitewashed and you know i'm trying to um make my religion fit according to everybody else etc etc uh one of the notes that i have is um one of the muslims jumped on to another life uh, there's a person called uh, mehraj he's uh, he's afghanistani he speaks persian He's one of the people that uh, I go on his lives. He lives in Germany. So I think it's Sunday evening at 7 o'clock Germany time. He starts his live on his TikTok channel. And he is very patient. He's very respectful. And the people that come on, the Muslims, uh, his condition is if you're Muslim, you have to turn your camera on. You know what I mean? Even for a split second, he just wants to see you. First day, a lot of them, they come up with a lot of excuses. Oh, there's no light. My light is switched off. It's dark here. My wife is sleeping next to me, etc., etc. Then when they do come on, a lot of them act like they're not Muslims. Even though in Islam, if you say you're not Muslim, that's a big sin. You know what I mean? You're denying your religion. Then they slowly, mm. slowly get a bit of a few words out of him. Then when they know they can't, uh, they can't say anything to prove him wrong, they start blatantly swearing in literally the most worst swearing words. They, they swear at his mother, they swear at his sister, his daughter, you know what I mean? All sorts of bad profanity. Um, one of the guys that came on, his name is Afghan Dawa. This guy acts like he's all-knowing in religion and he, he's a pretty much like a cleric or a scholar, so to say. Uh, the topic of uh, Bibi Hawa or Eve uh, being created from uh, Adam's left rib came up. And this guy said, no, there's no way. That's not accepted. That's a, that's a load of crap that you guys are making. And this, the host, Meraj, literally pulled up the Quran. He pulled up a Hadith. He pulled up Tasfir. And this guy literally denied all three of them, which makes him a non-Muslim. Uh, I thought after that, that, you know, his conscience as a man, as a Muslim, would not allowing him to come and preach religion or try to debate after that, but he's still active and he completely denies that that ever happened. The next thing is um, we were talking about, uh, I brought up this topic because I learned it from someone else, how um, one of the people from Mecca, I think it was, came up to Muhammad and he said, you know, my parents are uh, in hell. Uh, what can I do? And Muhammad told him, don't worry, my parents are in hell as well. A lot of Muslims deny yeah. that. But if we think about it logically, no, before, Muhammad, before Muhammad, there was no Islam. Therefore, they didn't have a nikah, which made it a what? An illegitimate marriage. And he was born a bastard, pretty much. When we say that... Everybody jumps on you and... And they start insulting, you know, how can you call the prophet a bastard, this and that. But that's the truth. That is what it is. This, you said now, according to Quran, um, not only Hadith. Yes. Quran in Surah yes. At-Tawbah, Surah At-Tawbah, uh, chapter 9, verse 80. Allah, he didn't allow to the Muhammad... To you know, read anything for his 
a relative, father, mother, uncle. It didn't allow him to read anything Quran for him. And it didn't ask Allah to guide him or put him in a Jannah. It didn't allow him in Quran. So, yes, but he, Muhammad, he insulted his uh, father and mother. Do you know that? Because his father and mother, his paganism, his polytheist, and Muhammad in Quran, he said, the polytheist is dirty, stinky, which means he literally insulted his father and mother. Sorry, brother, continue. Go ahead. That's okay. Sorry, Ahmed. Uh, I'm going to drop off because I got a phone call and now it's echoing. And I'll jump back on no in about problem. two minutes. Yeah. Okay, no problem, brother. Let okay, me accept another Muslim. You are very welcome anytime, brother. Anytime Thank you are you. very welcome. Thank you. I'll speak to you, you soon. Very yep. Thanks for watching. If you like my video, then please subscribe.